Our theme today is surveillance on the internet. Where are we today? Well, a few large companies dominate the internet. Social networking and searching have been constructed to violate our privacy. Corporations, spy agencies, and political actors now intrude on our use of the internet. We're going to talk about Cambridge Analytica as an example, the Cambridge Analytica scandal as an example of this uh, new form of surveillance that has emerged as the internet has been taken over by corporate actors. The implication is the reduction of human beings to simple manipulative things that can be controlled from above by the masters of corporations and states. Nevertheless, billions of people still use the internet and they use it for its original purpose to gather information, to communicate with each other, to um, read bedtime stories to children who are in faraway places, to buy and sell products. So the internet is a complicated machinery in which a few actors are attempting to gain undue control of human beings. So the question is, how did we get there? I need to talk about some history and some concepts to explain. First of all, the idea of the internet originates with the American military. The military had a organization called the Advanced Research Projects Agency, which was engaged in financing blue sky projects, what they called blue sky projects, projects that might pay off in the future, but had uh, were associated with a high risk of failure. At this time, a military doctrine emerged, which emphasized what was called C3, command, control, and communication. And communication is problematic in situations of war. It's difficult to maintain contact with the troops while bombs are falling all around you. The biggest danger is that the telephone network be destroyed and that you lose complete contact. Um, the generals can no longer communicate with the troops. Well, there was a new technology that was thought to be helpful in dealing with this. So in the 1960s, people were experimenting with something called packet switching. It doesn't have a central switching board like a circuit switch system such as a telephone. Instead, the data is digitized uh, and sent out in small packets with an address, and it can travel through many different paths to reach its destination, where again it is reassembled and forms the original message. So this is a decentralized communication system that could be very useful in a military context. One of the early uh, suggestions for using packet switching was t uh, radio communication between tanks on the battlefield. Uh, all the tanks could communicate with each other in a single network, and so if one tank was knocked out, the messages between the others could go through other tanks. I don't know if they ever deployed this system, but it gives you an idea of why they thought packet switching could be useful for a military. There's another uh, point of uh, significance. In the event of nuclear war, something called an electromagnetic pulse, AMP, could occur, which would knock out communications, and it would make it impossible to use the telephone network. However, it was hoped that a packet switch network going through many different um, pathways could survive EMP and so keep the generals in touch with the troops. Of course, the question of whether anyone would survive a nuclear war was not raised by uh, people at this time. So eventually then, in 1969, the military deployed a decentralized packet switch network on an experimental basis between a group of universities that had timeshare 
uh, at com large uh, mainframe computers. The idea was to allow data to be transmitted between these universities so that you could do time sharing, not just locally, but on a national scale. That's in 1969. In 1974, the uh, TCP IP system was invented that was eventually deployed on the internet. And this, uh, this system allowed networks to interact um, by, by putting all the data processing on the host computers, the individual computers that were hooked up. And by doing this, you made it possible to hook up a multiplicity of networks. And uh, you didn't, there was no longer any um, center to the network. Um, but it was now a fully distributed system. Here you can see the difference between a centralized and a decentralized system. The centralized system has a unique point of failure. The decentralized one can survive the loss of some of its nodes. This is what ARPANET looked like. You can see the many connections. It still was not completely decentralized. That came with the deployment of TCP IP in the 1970s. Well, the early internet went public in 1989, uh, first on a limited scale and then generally. And it's the software necessary for it to be really useful came in 1989 when Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web. And that's the system that makes it possible for us to use a browser. The World Wide Web uh, adapted an existing concept in computer uh, science called hypertext, a kind of decentralized index to use uh, on the network. It allowed you to leap between links, which we do now all the time, rather than finding data by going down a hierarchical menu like a library catalog. Browsers quickly emerged and uh, made it possible to use the World Wide Web in a user-friendly way. And this then led to the glory years when the internet became a kind of alternate public space, a new public space on which people could meet. Um, forums emerged, web forums emerged based on projects and common interests. Thousands and thousands of these forums uh, enabled people to communicate as a group in a radically new way. And out of this came eventually political movements deploying the internet in order to mobilize and educate. However, the uh, glory days ended. Platforms emerged which centralized the internet. The famous GAFA, Google, Facebook, Amazon, and Apple took over most of the connections. And the original decentralized internet became much more like uh, an ordinary communication system. Facebook is the star of the show. It combined two existing features of the earlier internet, what were called home pages, where people advertised themselves, and forums where they communicated. And you can still see this model on Facebook today. Each uh, user has a page, and that page consists of a, 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 uh, announcements about the user and forums in which people can discuss. Peter Thiel, the venture capitalist, got the idea early and was one of the first to finance the development of Facebook. He thought he could see in the homepage aspect a kind of vanity uh, project that would draw people in to show off and to emulate each other. And so with this uh, bit of psychology he derived from his studies at Stanford with René Girard, he uh, 
he uh, had the insight to sponsor the development of, space, of Facebook. There's a second factor involved in the centralization of the internet, not just the ambitions of corporations which managed to produce services that people liked, but also what is called the network effect. The value of a network depends on the number of connections. That depends in turn on the number of people who use the network. Here's an illustration. Two phones give you one interaction. Five phones allow for 10 interactions. 12 phones allows for 66 interactions. You can see this is a rapidly increasing uh, number of possible interactions as the number of connected of nodes increases. And so this then results in very large networks having a much greater value to their users than small networks. And that has a centralizing uh, implication. Well, at first, this didn't seem to make that much difference. But um, around 2000, Google decided to use a facility that it had developed to improve its search procedures to help advertisers reach users who might be interested in their product. So Google had already been collecting personal data to improve its service, but now it began to uh, sell that data to advertisers so they could uh, improve the uh, impact of their ads. And Facebook got into the same business in 2008, and this led to all sorts of innovations in the uh, processing of big data, the algorithmic processing of big data in order to uh, target people with uh, information that might concern them. Here are two cartoons which show the change. On the early internet, nobody knows you're a dog. But in the second cartoon, um, the dogs are saying, remember when nobody on the internet knew who you were? So the consequences of centralization have not all been good. Social networking has developed under a regime of network neutrality and uh, non-liability, where so all the communications on the net go through without any one being privileged, and no, the uh, platforms are not responsible for the content that appears on them. So it's a little bit like the phone network, where AT&T or Verizon can't uh, privilege some phone calls over others, and they're not responsible for what you say. So that was the original legal basis and technical basis for the uh, success of the platforms. But uh, as we s see more and more political uses of the network, we begin to wonder if, in fact, we're not dealing here with a public utility rather than a neutral platform. And a public utility, in other words, a kind of uh, monopoly that has implications for the well-being of the public and should therefore be regulated. And this is uh, this reflection on the future of the uh, big internet companies is a result of the abuse of corporate sleaze and ultimately even worse political sleaze by actors with no scruples who simply uh, uh, turn to the internet as a scene on which to manipulate uh, the credulous. And then, of course, revelations about spying have uh, made us much more distrustful of the internet than we used to be. It used to be that it was hard to find out who people were, but now it's easy. And uh, government agencies uh, and private uh, organizations are busy spying on us all the time. And this has led to the manipulation of voters by foreign actors, for the most part by the Russians. So this then leads us to the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Cambridge Analytica is a company in Britain 
that did political consulting and used it, it had an, uh, a network operation. It was purchased by a right-wing American billionaire named Robert Mercer, and he uh, saw a chance to uh, use it to help his favorite political candidate, Donald Trump. And at the same time, the Russians got involved uh, and started to use information collected by uh, Cambridge Analytica to influence voters in favor of Trump and against Hillary Clinton in the 2016 election. One of the readings is by uh, the one of the people who developed Cambridge Analytica's uh, platform as a uh, political system. The idea was simple. You paid some people to take a, a poll, use, a, use an app developed by a professor at Cambridge, and they, uh, using this app, exposed them and also their friends to the harvesting of, the, of their personal data. So you pretty soon got an enormous amount of data on, I think they, they reached 87 million people, and this data could then be processed and used to create a manipulative advertising. And the Russians obtained access to it, and eventually uh, it, it became a factor in the 2016 election. So this is a very discouraging outcome of what at first seemed like a noble project. It, it challenges our assumptions about democracy. Normally we think of democracy as a way for independent, more or less rational agents to make decisions. Of course, they may make mistakes and they're not completely rational, but we have for centuries assumed that they could learn from experience and make better decisions as they learned. In fact, we're discovering that human credulity is a more powerful factor than we thought, and people are more easily manipulated than we had hoped, especially when the actors engaged in the manipulation have no scruples about uh, manipulating people through their hatreds, their fears, their prejudices. So uh, the internet now appears to be um, a source of danger for democracy. The question is, can the internet be saved? Can it be returned to its original decentralized form? Well, regulatory interventions could help. The GAFA could be broken up. They are, in effect, monopolies, so they ought to be broken up. Laws could be passed protecting privacy, making it illegal to harvest and sell personal data. Perhaps the companies could go to subscription models like Netflix instead of ad the advertising model for which they need all that personal data. We could still have an internet, but it would be differently financed. And then there are technical interventions that have been proposed. Alternative platforms that promise not to harvest data, peer-to-peer -peer systems, which don't go through a central uh, operator like Facebook or Google, and use um, a technology called blockchain to create links of trust between users. These are all possibilities that we can hope will be deployed in the future to save the internet from uh, what it has become under the influence of malign actors in the last few years.